Hello, I'm Douglas, and this is the 16th video sermon in the iFaith series. Lately, we've been looking at the wisdom literature, parts of the Bible that give us wisdom for life, living life as God intended. We had two video sermons from Job, also two from Proverbs and two from Ecclesiastes. And this will be the last one in this unit, which is from the Song of Solomon. Now, why the Song of Solomon would be included in the wisdom literature, well, hopefully that will become clear soon enough. The song is truly a work of art. It's beautiful. It has inspired a lot of reflection, many hymns, and even controversy. On my wedding finger, this is my wedding band, 33 years ago, I removed that the first night of our honeymoon to see what was inscribed inside. It's something from the Song of Solomon, which my wife chose. I'll tell you what it was later on, and maybe you too can be inspired to think about God, love, and relationships in this study. Well, the song is not only a work of art, it's poetry, and there are many images. For example, we have the uh, lover, the male, we have the beloved, the female. The lover is described as a king. He's a shepherd, a brother, a tree, a gardener, a prince, even a gazelle, a type of antelope. She, the beloved, is a shepherdess. She's a heroine on a mission. She's a flower, a garden, a semi-divine being, a city, and a vine dresser. The song is not only a work of literature and art and poetry, it's a professional production. It seems to be a piece of theater with a female lead, a male lead, and even a chorus. Just a couple more introductory things. The book has different names. Song of Solomon, perhaps in honor of Solomon or to remember him, though it's not very clear that it's speaking of him in the book. It's also called Song of Songs, Canticles, Canticles, which are short songs, or I just call it Song. And even though it's short, only eight chapters, only 117 verses, it's truly rich. Uh, eight or 900 years ago, Bernard of Clairvaux managed to preach just from chapters one and two, 86 sermons. Well, we're gonna keep the message short. We'll focus on the central point of the song and that point, it's certainly one of the central themes, that point is repeated. We find it three times. The first time we find it is in chapter 2, verse 7. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and by the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. The passage speaks of waiting, not that there will never be love, there will never be that kind of intimacy, but God has timing and there's a discipline of waiting. Well, let's talk a bit about different views of love in marriage. I'd like to cover a number of unbiblical views, then we'll look at biblical views before we uh, move into a conclusion and some points of application. In the ancient world, as today, there is love poetry and a lot of it has survived. Often it's impure. Now, sometimes it's about a man and a wife, but not usually. In the ancient world, there were a number of sex goddesses or goddesses or gods of love. Think of Asherah, so popular in the Old Testament, in the Canaanite religion. We think of Greco-Roman religion with Aphrodite, Venus, uh, Eros, Cupid. Pagans had fertility cults, and to help along Mother Nature to ensure uh, good crops or to ensure that your wife would have children, uh, there was ritual prostitution. In the ancient world, sex is functional. It could be this kind of sex I was mentioning, sacred prostitution. Just as today, that still exists, and the ancient world had pornography. Uh, today is simply more high-tech pornography. Among the pagans, sex was considered legitimate outside of marriage, especially if you were a man. And yet promiscuity cheapens sex. Sexual immorality cheapens marriage and normally degrades women, even men, and certainly children. 
premarital sex, as many psychological studies have revealed, damages bonding. It, it damages our ability to really connect with our spouse. And yet, un, uh, unbiblical views are found not only among the religions of the idolaters, it's found even in the church. In the Middle Ages, Song of Solomon was typically interpreted not to be about a sexual relationship between a man and his wife, but rather to speak of something different, to be an allegory of the love between Christ and his church. Well, yes, you can justify this. You can find that uh, kind of imagery in the book of Revelation. Jesus is the groom, we are the bride, Revelation 21. We can find it in the book of Ephesians, the love of Christ for the church, which is like the love, or ideally should be like the love of a man for his wife. But that's really not the view of Song of Solomon, chapters 1 to 8. This book is talking about love, emotional, physical love, sexual bonding between a man and his wife. I like the way one of the scholars I've studied on this, his name is uh, Dwayne Garrett, I like the way he puts it. Let me just uh, share with you a brief quote. What the song establishes is the legitimacy and beauty of a husband and wife experiencing heated desire for one another. The song achieves something that medieval Christian culture could not fathom and that modern and postmodern culture cannot artfully attain. And what is that? A man and woman who maintain passionate desire for each other in the context of conventional morality. Now that's a great quote. He's saying that in the medieval world that they just didn't get it. And really that's because some strange views about sexuality started emerging back in the second and third century. And he's also saying that the modern world doesn't get it. Sex is reduced to something that's uh, perhaps an end for itself, just for, just for pleasure, but at any rate, it's not understood in its proper context in a conventional morality. In short, the Bible rejects not just promiscuity, the Bible also rejects asceticism. That is, being hard on yourself, depriving yourself of sex by not marrying, depriving ourselves of food or other uh, essential parts of life, just, just to be tough. And Colossians 2, the second half of that chapter, especially makes that clear. Well, I read the passage in chapter 2. It's repeated in the same words, verbatim, in chapter 3. Daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and the does of the field, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. You know, I'm actually reminded of this point of timing and patience because I'm recording this on a spring day. I'm in Atlanta uh, sitting behind our house and the trees are starting to turn green. The blossoms are coming. Uh, there's a time for this and there's a time where it would be counterproductive where if things bloomed they, they would die. Uh, just as there are cycles in nature, there's wisdom in nature, there's wisdom in sexual love. But what is the biblical view? Well, first, not to be embarrassed. The Bible's quite explicit about sex, unlike the stuffy clergy and monks of the Middle Ages. In fact, you find sex in the Bible on page one and page two, uh, when we see uh, the man and his wife together becoming one flesh, naked. I mean, this is not hidden. And those who think that the Bible suppresses sexuality, well, I can tell you, they haven't read the Bible. In the context of marriage, sex is good and it's wholesome. The Song of Solomon is arranged because it's poetry into 13 uh, cantos, like 13 sections. So you have the first six sections, the central section, and the final six sections. And that middle section, that is canto seven, is the marriage of this bride and groom. That's at the very center. You have the lead up and then you have the rejoicing and uh, the, the marriage itself is right at the center. The biblical view is not just marriage to whoever you want to marry, but it's a spiritual thing. It's a heterosexual relationship. It is a monogamous relationship. That is one wife, one husband. That's what we see in Genesis 2. Yes, yes, the Old Testament uh, shows a number of, of men with multiple wives, which was 
accepted in the culture of the day if you could afford it. And yet the Old Testament shows us the relational damage and the heartache that come with polygamy. I think it hardly could be, it can be interpreted to be supporting having uh, many uh, husbands or wives. In the New Testament, monogamy is implied in the key marital text of Ephesians 5. Well, the biblical view goes further. In the Song of Solomon, the uh, woman will lose her virginity, and this is celebrated. It's the newness of sexual experience. It's not that she had to become experienced, and when she had been with lots of men, then maybe there would be a proper match that would not lead to divorce. No, the loss of virginity is celebrated, and it's much anticipated. In chapter 3, the groom is like a king, and the uh, bride is like his queen. He treats her royally. The biblical view of marriage honors the body. It's not the view of some of the Greek philosophers that the body is inferior or dirty, or that the real part of you is your soul, not your body. That's a sub-biblical view. We honor the body, and in marriage we honor one another's body. There's no lust, but there is honor. And then last, there's faithfulness. As we see in chapter 8, verse 6, love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. Love burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. It's a passage about proper jealousy. And you'll see in the Song of Solomon, there's the expectation that she is the only woman for him. He will be the only man for her. And so we've looked at some of the unbiblical views that sex is simply functional or it's okay outside of marriage, or even that it's unclean and that spiritual people avoid it. We've also looked at the biblical view that sex is good in the context of marriage, nothing to be embarrassed about. In, if sex is heterosexual, monogamous, this is the time in marriage when virginity is lost and the body is honored and faithfulness, mutual exclusivity, being faithful to one another um, is our commitment. Well, let's wind down the message and have a little bit of application. I said it, the, the key passage is repeated three times. Let me read the third and final time. It's actually a little shorter here. 8-4, daughters of Jerusalem, I charge you, do not arouse or awaken love until it so desires. And so that's the wisdom of waiting, the wisdom of patience and doing it God's way. I mentioned my ring, the wedding band um, my, my wife got from me, and I took off my finger that evening of our uh, first day of marriage, and I read it. And she had put in there, Song of Songs 8-7. Many waters cannot quench love. Rivers cannot sweep it away. Something about the strength, of the firmness of that bond and the permanence of that marriage vow. Application, well, there's fun and beauty and wonder in marital sex. Not supposed to be boring, but fun, uh, beautiful, and there's a sense of awesomeness. On the other hand, the Bible also teaches that until that point, and marriage is not for everybody, but there must be celibacy. In fact, if you can remain celibate, Jesus and Paul tell us that's the ideal. Matthew 19, 1 Corinthians 7. Like the gospel, Song of Songs speaks of our need for relational intimacy, for relational transcendence. It's more than just me and another person. It's with God. And then that lift with God, the relationship is lifted up to a higher level uh, of intimacy and permanency. The song teaches us that we should keep sex in marriage, and that is true wisdom. Monogamous, heterosexual, permanent, faithful, intimate marriage. Thank you for listening to this lesson on the Song of Songs, and this concludes our unit on the wisdom literature. In the iFaith series, our third unit will be on the Jewish documents of the New Testament, starting with the Gospel of Matthew. I hope you'll take advantage of that and tell your friends about these free video sermons. God bless.